Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on IP protection in health. Uh, this is the first webinar of the Join Health Autumn series. And this is actually the first of a series of six webinars that from today on will take place every Tuesday at the same time, 2.30 Portuguese time, 3.30 Central European time. For the newcomers, just a, a brief note to let you know that these webinars are a joint initiative of the Health Cluster Portugal and the IT Health. Uh, you can see on the screen also Miguel Amador and Vera Moura from the EIT. Um, and about the agenda for today, we will have uh, uh, and we will start with Susana Armario from the Portuguese Institute of Industrial Property. She will share some basics about the topic regarding the health sector. And then we will have Philippe Delton, who will present the main characteristics of the IP system in China and also in key markets of Southeast Asia. And Alessandra Capriglia, who will very briefly present the services provided by the China and Southeast Asia IP SME help desk. This is an assistance service for European SMEs that operate or intend to access these markets. So thank you so much, you all, for accepting this invitation. Um, and now for just a brief note for the participants. Uh, today we have a, a, a tight schedule. Uh, we'll have, any, in any case, after each presentation, a few minutes for questions from the audience. And for that, we invite you to use the Q&A tool. So, in any case, if we don't have time to, to put all your questions during the session, we, we ask you to use the comments and suggestions box of the survey that will be sent after the webinar, and we will share them with the speakers. As usual, the presentation slides and the recording of this session will be available after the webinar. So uh, please provide your email address on the survey after the webinar if you'd like to receive the presentations and the recording will be on the Health Cluster Portugal's YouTube channel. Moving to the first presentation of this session, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Susana Armario, who is already a, a regular in these Health Cluster Portugal events. Susana is the head of the External Relations Department of the Portuguese Institute of Industrial Property, where she began her career in 2007 as patent examiner um, in the field of chemistry and biotech. Uh, before that, she worked in a food business company and in a pharma company, and her background is biological engineering. She also has a master in economics and management of science, technology and innovation, and a post-graduation in economics and management of industrial property. She's also a certified trainer by ConPro Professional Training, Consulting and Project. So, Susanna, uh, thank you so much for accepting once again uh, this invitation and I invite you to please start your presentation. Thank you, Patricia, for this kind introduction. Um, I would like to start to thank, uh, to thank uh, Health Cluster uh, Portugal and EET uh, Health for this, uh, this invitation once again. I'm here and it's a big, big pleasure to be here with you today. I'm going to speak about uh, IP and uh, its, its relation specifically, specifically with the health uh, area. So I hope you, you all are seeing my presentation. If yes. everything is okay. Okay. So Today I'm here to talk about um, the difference between uh, industrial property and intellectual property. There's sometimes some uh, confusion between those uh, terms. Uh, then I'm talk going to talk about the importance of IP rights um, and how can you patent, uh, how can you protect your uh, invention uh, through a patent and what you cannot protect through a, a patent. Then I'm going to talk what you need to uh, comply with it and let it for you to have a patent. What are the routes? So what are the territories that you can protect your invention? And some databases is some information that I think it's going to be very useful for you. So first, first things first, um, intellectual property, sometimes it's confused with the industrial, industrial property. And um, the intellectual property is the, the umbrella. And then we have two branches. We have the industrial property you know, on one side that 
PIMP manages, so the Portuguese Institute for Industrial Property. And then we have the copyright that, that in Portugal is from uh, the competence of IGAC, so in the cultural ministry. Uh, and basically, intellectual property is uh, the protection of all creation uh, by, made by man. So you can protect the artistic side. So like, for example, a music, uh, a book, a movie. And in, in this case, you're talking about copyrights or you can protect your commercial signs, your designs, your inventions. And in this case, we are talking about the industrial property. So now narrowing, narrowing down to industrial property. We have two types, two major types of rights. Then when in one hand, we have the technological rights. So in here we have patents, utility models and SPCs. Actually, I'm not going to talk about much about SPCs, but just to have this small note, SPCs actually extend patents for medicinal drugs or phytopharma uh, products. Uh, and then in the other uh, branch, you have the commercial rights. In here, you have trademarks, logos, designs, and other uh, types of commercial signs. So just an overview, trademarks are the, the main, uh, most known uh, IP right from, every, from uh, the, public, the public in general. So we are uh, constantly uh, surrounded by trademarks in our lives, in our clothes, in the, in the TV, in everything that surrounds us. So they identify products and services of a company and they distinguish from other products and other services from other companies. So they basically it's their um, goal is to, um, to distinguish between those. And then you have the design. So you can protect the aesthetics of a, of a product. For example, if you have a car, you can protect its design or for example, the design of a, a cellular phone or um, the bottle of Coca-Cola, for example. And then you have the technological rights. So patents and utility models and they protect inventions. So uh, when you're talking about some product that, that you're going to the market, you generally don't choose between a patent or a trademark or a design. Generally, the products that are in the market, they have different layers of protection. The, the, mo the most layers they have, the bigger protection they, ha they have. So in this case, we here have the, um, the swimming suit of Michael Phelps that he used a few years back. And here you have a trademark, a, sp a Speedo. Then you have the patent, so the technology be behind the, um, the swimming suit that was actually was fused, both uh, the, um, the fabrics were fused. And then you have the design. The design, the aesthetics was produced uh, by a, a, an Italian company, the patent by a Portuguese company, and then um, all together they composed the same product. Another example that is very known are the seller phones. The seller, the seller phones have hundreds of patents and a lot of designs, lots of tra trademarks, even um, trade secrets. So they have a lot of different layers of protection that compose the same product. So why should we protect RIP? So the basic uh, importance is that we need to protect ourselves from others that want to copy us uh, and we don't authorization, uh, don't give authorization, of course. So in this example, um, you can take, for example, you are investing in R&D, you are develop, developing some product, and uh, depending on the complexity of that product, you can take a few months, a few years, a lot of years, and you can spend a lot of money actually reaching the point where you have a market a product, something that is ready to go to the market. And once you reach the, 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 the market, you already have your patent, for example, you start, you start to commercialize it. And because you have a patent, others cannot copy you and use your patent without your authorization. So if everything goes well, if your invention has success, you can appropriate from the, the money that is going to be generated and actually pay your debts and actually uh, put that, that extra money in more innovation. So 
the, the goal here is to promote innovation. So you can appropriate from the gain needs that your product is going to make. But if you're not, if you don't have IP, if you're not protected, what happens is that once you reach the market, you start to have competitors. So your competitors are going to copy your product and really depending on the complexity of that product, they can take just a few weeks, a few, few years, it really depends, but they reach it and, uh, and they go to the market and they compete with you. So what happens is that the innovator, he has to um, apply a specific amount of money in order to have a return and to pay his debts. But the competitors, they only spend money to copy it. And sometimes that, uh, that product that they, they copy it, it's not 100% equal. Sometimes it's, it have a, a lesser quality. And sometimes for the consumer, that's, that's fine. Sometimes people want to pay less money. So it's kind of unfair and you really don't have any, any way to protect yourself. And what happens is that the innovator doesn't want to innovate anymore because it's, it's a loss of time. It's a loss of time and a loss of money and everybody copy in. So without no IP, you have no protection. So how can you protect your invention? The first thing that you need to know is that an invention is always a solution that is new and inventive for a technical problem. So generally when people say, I have an idea and I want to protect as a patent, generally <laughs> that's not very, uh, a very good, um, it's not very, a very good um, idea, let's say. <laughs> we, have, we need to have a specific concrete Invention. So you have um, a problem, for example, uh, you need to, to take a selfie and you're alone and you want to have depth and a good picture and you want to take it yourself. So your solution is the stick. So the stick is, the, is the, actually the patent, what you're going to patent it. So you need to think what is your problem and how can I solve it? And the solution is the invention. So Ideas cannot be protected. There are only abstract things. You need to, to, um, to protect something that is actually real. So what is a patent? Basically, it's a social contract between the state and the inventor. So the inventor, he disclosed everything regarding that invention. So the goal here is to prevent that information, knowledge, remains uh, in secret. We want society to benefit from it. We want society to learn from it, to actually um, take their, that knowledge and um, do other solutions, other technologies, or even do upgrades to that technology. And then we stimulate new patents. On the other hand, the state gives, us, uh, gives that inventor a monopoly of, of that market. So uh, if you want to... protect, for example, and he can, can uh, or even uh, allow others with, their, with its authorization. I'm sorry, I have in, uh, unstable internet, so if you cannot hear me, please. No, no, no it's okay, no, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay? Okay. So um, you can commercialize your invention in the protected territory, but you can, uh, you can, even allow others to commercialize it for you. And, and you can prevent others from commercializing without author your authorization. So basically that's the contract. So what can you protect? Basically a patent that can be a product, for example, a medicinal drug, uh, a device, some, some, uh, some temperature uh, uh, dispositives, some, some machines, some fermenter, something. Uh, you can protect process or methods, for example, a process to produce um, some medicinal drug, for example, or some food uh, product. And you can, you can also protect the use, the use, for example, of a medicinal drug in a specific uh, disease. So basically, this, this is what you, you generally have, um, you generally you protect in a patent. Of course, you can have a product, 
a process to produce that product and a use of that product. You can produce, you can protect all of those in the same patents, but it needs to have a common um, link between them. So what can we protect? So in USA is basically everything, everything that man, man creates, he can protect it. In Europe and in Portugal in specific, we are a little bit more restrict. So basically the first thing you need to have an invention. So you need to have a technical solution for a technical problem. The other, um, the other uh, important thing is that you need to comply with the uh, patentability, patentability requirements. So your invention must be novel, must be inventive and must have an industrial application. So this is the requirements for granting a patent. If you fail one of those, you don't have a patent. So you need to comply with all of them. So the first one, novelty. Novelty, novelty is absolute. So that means that you have a patent, you file your patent today, the examiner uh, sees everything that was published until the day before your filing and he's going to do a search worldwide. So that means if somebody three years before in China actually came up with the same solution and he disclosed on internet, then you don't have a patent because you don't have novelty. For example, if you went to some Congress and you spoke about your patents and then you tried to file a patent um, some years afterwards, your own disclosure is enough to destroy novelty. So beware of novelty. Then you have a second uh, criteria that is inventive step. And that means that, okay, if your invention is novel, okay, you have some, some difference, for example, an extra component, and they're going to check if that extra component is actually obvious. For example, if, if it was just put there to, to grant uh, to give novelty and it's actually something arbitrary, then you don't have an inventive step. Or maybe you put something there that you already know that that machine is going to be faster. No, that's not inventive step. It must be something that we are not really expecting from, from, from what we already know from that area. Then you have the industrial application. And this is the easiest one to um, comply because basically uh, the, the product or, or your invention must be fabricated, manufactured or used in any kind of industry or even in agriculture. So it's the easiest one to comply with it. Then territories, territories are very, very, very important. When you're choosing uh, where you're going to, to patent it, you really need to understand what are your markets, which markets you want to commercialize your invention. And every country has its national route. In our national route, INP is the one, is the entity that is responsible for it. So if you if IP, INP grants um, a patent, you have protection in Portugal, only in Portugal. So that means that somebody in Spain really likes your invention, they can take your invention to Spain, and commercialize it there, but they cannot export to the to Portugal that is protected. So if you are interested in just two or three countries, then you choose the national route. So for example, you, only, you are only interested in the Iberia territory. So you choose uh, nationally. You file a patent in Portugal, for example, and then you go to Spain, claim the, the priority of the Portuguese application and then you file there a, a patent. For example, if you want the European territory, then the best choice is the, to use the, the European patent application. So basically you can go to Portugal to INPI and file there a patent application, the European patent application, and then you have access to 38 countries in Europe. Uh, there's a catch here. So who will the, the, the entity that is going to actually study this invention is going to be um, the European Patent Office and they're going to grant that patent for all the countries or refuse for all the countries. And if they grant for all the countries, you need to validate 
in each country. That means that you need to pay a fee and deliver a translation in every country that you want protection. Then you have the International Route, or PCT, Patent Cooperation Treaty. Once again, you can file this kind of obligation in Portugal. It gives you access to 153 countries. And uh, the difference here is that, okay, the, the World, the world um, Intellectual Property Office, uh, Organization is going to actually um, do some of the procedures uh, centralized, but then it's going to send that application to the one uh, to to each of the member states. So it's the countries they're going to uh, grant that patent according to that their law. So in, in reality, some countries can refuse it, others can grant it. It really depends on their law. So bio patents. So all bio patents can um, must comply with. The, the, the criteria, so they must be new with effective step and have uh, industrial application. And what can be protected in biotech? Uh, any invention that basically uses biological material. We're talking about cells, we're talking about virus, we're, about, we're talking about vectors, so we can um, protect a lot of things here. So what is not patentable first? Um, the first thing that you need to know is whether you have a discover, discovery or an invention. Um, a discovery is just, for example, you sequence some genome and you have that knowledge. So this is only abstract, it's not an invention. The invention is actually taking that knowledge that is free, that everybody, everybody have access, and actually transform it into a vaccine. And the vaccine is your invention and the vaccine can be patentable. So generally what you cannot protect as a patent, any discoveries, any scientific uh, theories and mathematical methods. Once again, it's abstract, not concrete. Then co computer co programs, I'm talking about softwares, not uh, for itself, not the way the, that softwares work in some computer or, or some um, physical um, um, machine. So, uh, the, uh, the, the, the process of, of a software can be protected, but not the software itself. Then presentations of information, static creations, and business methods cannot be protected. In the biotech area, so the human body and its elements, so if you just find a, a gene, you cannot protect it. You need to do something with that gene, with that information. You need to, to transform it into an invention. Then surgery and therapy, in therapy methods cannot be protected. You cannot protect, for example, a method of um, treating malaria, for example, uh, because we not, cannot restrain the, the, the function of a, of a doctor in order for him to pass, the, to give the best treatment for his patient. But you can protect any substance, any medicinal drug, so you can, you can protect uh, component A, B, C, to, protect, uh, to, to treat malaria, you can protect that. So the component, not the method. And then the diagnostic methods that actually are applied to the human bodies. That means that if you have, for example, um, uh, some testing of allergies that use your own arm, in that case, you do not have a patent, why? Because the, the subject is used for all the pass, for all the procedures, including for the diagnosis. If you have um, any diagnostic methods that actually uh, uses some sample, human sample, and then goes to the laboratory, then you, have, you can have a patent. Any plant or animal variety is not patentable. That means that if you have a new variety for itself, it's not patentable, but if you have, um, for example, a, a, new, a new plant variety that you use to extract some component that is going to make a medicinal drug to can treat cancer, then you can protect it, but not just to have a new variety. The same being said to OMGs. So even if you have a bacteria that is genetical, uh, genetically uh, modified, you need to have a function for it. You need to have a purpose. Otherwise you just have 
a new bacteria. Then any essential biological process, for example, uh, pollinization cannot be protected. So natural things that already occurred in, nat in nature cannot be protected. Then in the other hand, you have um, inventions that are inventions, but uh, because of uh, morality, they cannot be protected. For example, for example, any process of cloning humans, process to modify gen genetics, germinal identity, um, the use of human embryos that actually going to result in their destruction cannot be used, so they're un unethical. And then any process that actually going to modify a specific animal, animal that is going to cause him some suffering and there's no beneficial for the society. That means if you have, for example, uh, a mouse and you change him to, in order for him to have cancer and then the test some medicinal drugs for cancer, uh, the rat is going to have a lot of suffering, but the society is going to benefit a lot. But if you have, for example, uh, some tests, you want to test, for example, uh, cream for wrinkles or some air product, just is, that is just cosmetic. So it's not worth the suffering of the animal for uh, the, the convenience of the society. So, so what are the common mistakes made by the inventor? Generally, is disclosing the invention before filing a patent. That's number one mistake. The second one is that normally people don't check it around the world, whether or not that venture already exists, already exists. And generally um, people do, do not check if it's novel. So, and most times the venture might not be novel. Then uh, you need to comply with all the time limits when you have a patent proceeding. Never, never fail a deadline. You need to, to, to understand um, what the market wants, because sometimes you can spend a lot of time and energy actually, um, actually producing something that nobody wants. And then you might just wait on it too much time and not deposit in time. That sometimes works. You have uh, uh, research doing, and then you move on to another research and you say, okay, well, I'm going to return for this uh, few years afterwards, and then it's too late. Somebody already beat you. And um, another common mistake is not disclosing every technical matter. Remember, the society must benefit from the knowledge. So you need to disclose everything. And the major one, common mistake is keeping, keeping it a secret and not patenting it. But if you do it right, you can have yourself a blockbuster. You can have, for example, Stanford, they, he has three blockbusters that actually funded a lot of its research. So uh, it's not easy to have these blockbusters, but it's doable. So where you can find patent information, it's very, very important when you are in research and development. So in the office, such as INPI, we use commercial databases, but you can use any of those uh, free online databases. They have, for example, patent, uh, patent scope or SPASNet, they have the same information that our own databases uh, have, and you have you have good tools to, to just to search and actually see what is information uh, that exists out there. So what is the, the, the biggest goal behind IP? IP gives you, uh, gives you um, the ability to actually protect yourself from others. Remember that um, if you have a house that won't prevent people from robbing you, but you have uh, at your disposal some mechanisms to defend yourself. For example, you can go to go court, you can uh, go to the authorities and actually file a complaint. It's the same in, in IP. Uh, you can file a complaint, a, a complaint or go to the court. So we have mechanisms, legal mechanisms that actually defend you. And you can all, all also profit from it. This, this is the main goal. You need to profit from it in order to cover your, your expenses. So you can do it yourself if you have, a, for example, a factory, or you can do through others. For example, you sell that patent because it can be sold. You can also licensing. So it's, it's equivalent to renting a house, for example, in taking this, this example. 
uh, and then people pay you uh, royalties. Uh, but the big biggest um, the biggest uh, importance of IP rights is to actually stimulate innovation. So we cannot copy it. So we can understand from from the knowledge. You can reach new solutions. You can improve the ones that are already patented, and then that will generate new patents. So in the macro uh, state, you can see that uh, countries can be can grow economically and have a bigger development, and even have a bigger biggest development in techno technological uh, terms. So this is the, the, the importance behind the IP rights is to, to, in the micro. So allow you to have um, com com commercialize your, your product, having protection and then at macro helps the country to grow. If you have any questions, I'm going to take some time for, for questions, I think. We are more or less 15 minutes for questions. So. Thank you, Susanna. So we don't forget if you have any question, you can post that question on, on the Q&A uh, on Zoom. So feel free to make some questions to further understand this, but but meanwhile, I think Verya had some questions. Yes, th this is a question that I uh, always make um, because it's uh, something that uh, when you are writing a patent, uh, everyone should be aware of. And uh, since we have our expert expert here she can talk to us a little bit about this how much information do we need to put into a patent because it's often said don't uh, publish um, patent first but uh, often people do it in a rush so how much information should a patent have to be considered solid um, and worthwhile um, submitting the first thing that you should do is to put everything that you need protect protection. So, uh, if you all your technical features must be there. If you fail one technical feature, and that technical feature is actually the one most important, is the, actually the most important one, then you have a big problem there. Uh, normally, when you do R and D, you have a lot of um, experimental data, so you can pilot. So in Portugal, you don't have um, like. Um, uh, limit of page to, pages, so you can put everything that you want there. But uh, the, the most important thing is that all the technical features must be there. And you should make uh, an exercise in, the, um, in order to understand what are the technical features, the best technical features. So normally, if you do a, um, a search and actually see what are the, the, the inventions that are most uh, similar to yours, you actually can um, point out what are the, the biggest um, features that you need, really need to focus your, your, intention, your attention. And you actually need to, to explain on the description um, the technical effect of that. Also. That means that uh, you need to uh, um, explain why that difference is essential for the patent and it's not obvious for regarding anything that you already have disclosed in other documents. So my, my advice would be do a search first, actually really understand what are the difference and then focus your, um, your patent applications on those differences. And don't forget technical features that might be relevant. Uh, the problem is that if you don't have any no notion at the time of your research, um, what is the, the direction of your uh, investigation? For example, you did the patent now and you have a, a set of fees and then you continue to do research and uh, you, you test a new idea. And that new idea actually means a new feature. That is a problem because it's not contemplated on okay. the first one. So we, we really need to understand uh, when are your research more or less complete and actually uh, juggle it with the disclosures that you need to do when you present a paper or you're going to a Congress or something. 
Yes, uh, for instance, it's, it's usual that something is uh, being researched for therapy, but can also be used for diagnostics in the future. And in the beginning, we don't even think about this. But then in the middle of the process, oh, if this can treat, if I change just a little bit, it can also be used for diagnostics, for instance. So it's very good to, to, to be very open-minded about the, the invention when we are starting and having more than one problem that it can solve. So it's very very good to, to, to be in a, in a team and to, to talk about the invention with others that can bring more knowledge and maybe more highlights into the future so that the patent could have a, 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 a wider scope. Yes. Um, yes. And, uh, Susanna, what is your advice uh, for when to patent? Because the patent has 20 years um, um, of of uh, exist of life, um, yes. And if we patent too early, then we take too long in in the healthcare sector. We take too long to develop mm -hmm. and to be ready for for market. And then, if the goal is to license the patent, for instance, um, the the half life of the patent is too short because most of the time was spent on research. So what is your advice on the timing for setting up the, the, the patent? Yeah, that should actually, uh, it really depends uh, on whether your, uh, your area, for example, if you have like a medicinal, medicinal drug, sometimes that, um, that process starts uh, some, some, somewhere at the same time of the clinical trials. So it, it really depends uh, on the, on the type, type of, um, of, uh, of product. For example, if you're talking about some mechanical dispositive that you use in, in medicine, uh, it, you can file it when you want to because you don't have um, the clinical trials. So they, they want to consume part of your um, patentability uh, periods. But uh, for example, in the medicinal drug, you have the SBCs, they actually mention it. So uh, what happens is that you fight for a patent somewhere at the beginning of the, med uh, the, of the trials, of the clinical trials. And actually, yes, it's going to con consume a lot of time, sometimes five years, 10 years, 15 years. But then you have the SPC. So the SPCs actually grant you a five year extra at maximum. Uh, so you, you, it's, a, it's a compensation, let's say, uh, that, uh, the, um, that the law gave to the, the pharma companies and to anybody that actually produces a medicinal drug. In, in university or whatever, it doesn't, mean, it doesn't have to be a pharmaceutical company. So it really depends what type of, of, of product that you have. And, uh, and it's, it's not, you don't have really um, an ideal timing. You need to understand what is being done for your competitors and actually anticipate them. So it's kind of um, it's a it's kind of a, um, understanding what happens in the other competitors where you where you're at uh, uh, in the development, and then uh, just go along and hope for the best. Thank you, thank you, Susanna. Mikael, uh, if you just can uh, permit me, um, just to say uh, to your first question. Uh, it's very important to actually decide IP before doing the research. So having a plan for it. What am I going to do? Um, am I going to patent it? Am I going to uh, have a trademark? Uh, who is going to be the owner of that patent? When do we? When are we supposed to start patenting? So at the at the genesis of any project you should think about IP first. That's an and who will pay for it? It gets and expensive at yes. some point. <laughs> yes, because in Portugal, it's, 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 very, uh, it's very inexpensive. But if you go to Europe, if you go to a PCT, and you, have, you need more financing without no doubt. If I if you can jump in, uh, just because you mentioned the costs, I had a, a, a small question about this. So 
Um, are the costs exponentially bigger when you go from uh, an EPC to a PCT, or is it just a matter of the the number of countries to which you have to 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 have a translation of the process? Yeah. Sometimes the application is not that uh, expensive and it, it doesn't have a, a lot of differences. The problem is that throughout the, the, the process, you need, to, um, you need to file documents, you need to uh, respond to communications. And um, if it is centralized, it's more or less unexpected. And inspect, and inspect, <laughs> it's, it's not yeah, expensive. And expensive, yeah. Sorry. Um, but the problem is that in um, EP uh, application, you reach a point when it's granted and you need to validate. So that's, the, that's when the costs actually ar arise because you have 38 countries. So you need to go to each of those countries. You don't have to choose all of them, but if you want to all of them, you need to go to each one of them and pay, pay a fee there and actually uh, file a translation. So you need to somebody to, to translate for the, for example, we need to translate to Italian and they then go to Italian office, pay the fee and, and present the, the application. So the, 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 the money there, the, the expenses there, they grow a lot because of the number of, of uh, countries. When you go to the PCT, you have 153 countries. So, and you do, you do need to have a lot, of, uh, a lot of procedures in the national phase in those countries. So basically, um, WIPO is going to uh, receive the application from us. It's going to understand if everything is all right. It's going to have a file of communication if something is wrong. It's going to publish it. It's going to actually talk with a NICE and an international authority of search to, to do the search. So we're going to give a preliminary report. We're going to do everything centralized. But then it reaches the point when the actual examination must be made. And WIPO is not going to do that. It's going to be the countries. So you need to understand 153 countries. So once you go to each country and file a translation for them to analyze, then the costs go up. And then um, there's, no, there's also some, some difference because you should also always have a lawyer, an IP lawyer when you go. It's not mandatory, but yeah, you should have one because it's not an easy process and you need to take into account those costs. So, yes, the difference between one and the other is it's very, it's very big and it's due because of the number of countries without, without no doubt. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Susanna. I'm not sure if uh, there is any other questions, Miguel. No, no, we don't have questions. More questions from the audience. So. Okay, so I think we can move to the to the next presentation of this afternoon. Um, I will ask Susanna to please stop sharing uh, the screen. Okay, sorry. Thank you. So thank you very much, Susanna, uh, once again for for this very clear overview of the IP protection process. Um, so um, now we'll move to the next presentation of this afternoon by Philippe Del Tom and Alexandra uh, Capriglia. So uh, Philippe is partner at AGM Avogados and has been assisting innovation players from Europe to China and to Southeast Asia for 10 years. He provides negotiation and legal support in areas ranging from IP protection uh, to technology transfer and internationalization strategy. And Alessandra is the project, project executive at China IP SME Help Desk. So uh, they will be presenting these uh, services of the SME Help Desk and also the, uh, some overview of the, the process of IP protection in China and Southeast Asia. So thank you very much, uh, you both, for accepting this invitation and the screen is yours. Thank you. All right, um, Philippe, if I may start. Sure, take the yeah. floor. <laughs> okay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks again, Health Class for Portugal for having us. Uh, I think we kickstarted this event with a very insightful and important presentation by Susanna. Um, she shares some notions that are for sure 
very useful uh, also um, when considering internationalization of, of, of your solution, of your products. Now we're shifting the attention, as mentioned, um, towards IP protection in third countries. So when expanding to third countries, um, specifically uh, regarding Southeast Asia and China. Now, before giving the floor to Philippe, who's going to deliver uh, the training for you, I'm going to uh, briefly uh, introduce two European funded projects that you should keep in mind when considering going to those regions, um, if you need some um, initial support on IP protection. Um, okay. So yes, uh, my name is Alessandra Capriglia, project executive for the China PSME help desk here, my email address in case you want to uh, be in touch and receive some materials or just to um, be connected with um, our IP expert. Um, okay, very briefly, the China and, and Southeast Asia PSME help desk are um, project, EU funded projects that were launched by the European uh, Commission with the goal to support European uh, companies expanding to more complicated third markets where they do not really have an understanding of the complexity of uh, the IP system. Being IP, as, as we said uh, just before, uh, considered a matter that is quite uh, expensive and full of legal jargon. But it is uh, yet a, a very important factor for a successful internationalization. The help desk then represents a sort of intermediate step for SMEs uh, to make more informed and strategic decisions regarding their intellectual property. Uh, more specifically, uh, we offer free initial advice to small and medium enterprises in the form of one-on-one -on -one advisory and by providing a series of online tools to better understand your assets and how you can leverage your IP in China and Southeast Asia. So our target um, uh, audience is uh, our European SMEs, small and medium enterprises who are planning to go to those countries or are already there uh, or are potentially interested in establishing a um, commercial or R&D activities in those regions. Um, of course, our most important service is our helpline. Uh, SM, uh, SMEs can write us through our inquiry helpline and submit any questions related to IP protection in China and Southeast Asia. And uh, they will receive a free confidential advice within three working days. Of course, all questions are treated confidentially um, in accordance with all EU data protection guidelines. Uh, the help desk is uh, the help desk website is full of a, um, a big variety of materials such as jargon free IP guides, regional fact sheets, um, case studies like real case studies, uh, as well as uh, a blog um, part where you can read about the latest developments of um, the IP system in those regions. Here are a couple of examples of what you can find on our website. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see, for example, an infographic on trade secrets in China and on the left hand side, uh, IP in the ICT industry in Southeast Asia. Now, the China Southeast Asia IP SME help desk are part of a bigger family of international IP SME help desk. Um, each help desk provides the same uh, similar services uh, covering um, uh, different regions around the world, being Latin America, Southeast Asia, India, China, and Europe. Um, and very soon, the Africa IBSME Help Desk will be launched soon. So we're all reunited under the big umbrella of uh, the European Commission website. So feel free to visit the website to find the contact details of each help desk if you're interested in going to those countries. And uh, receive some initial advice on how to develop your IP strategy. Um, of course, follow us on our social media. We uh, post about our events and uh, latest publication that we develop with our IP experts, and we publish on YouTube our past webinars. Now, I'll give the floor to Philippe, who's going to deliver the training. Philippe is, will try to uh, leave 10 minutes at the end of his presentation for any questions from the audience, we really invite you to ask him any question. It's a great opportunity. 
Thanks again and enjoy the training. And I should stop sharing. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I don't know. Um, I don't know if you can show me my slides. Anyway, I can first uh, introduce myself, even if Patricia did it quite nicely. It's just that um, I was used to, to be traveling six months a year in, uh, in Asia. That's not possible any longer. So I'm, I'm now a resident in the Swiss mountain. So I hope the connection will be stable all the time long first. Second, uh, in addition to AGM, AGM Abogados, I'm also pleased to join NOVA, which is a financial transaction law firm, uh, kind of a rising star in France, and also a, another law firm in Milan, Lexia. So this is, this is for me. Uh, you said the rest, Patricia. Uh, let me know how I can see my own slide. Uh Philip, uh, you can share screen and yeah, you can sure. share your own uh, presentation. So it's easier for you to move uh, um, slides. Mm, mm, mm. On the bottom of your screen, you should have the share screen on green, in green. Um, mm, mm, mm. Maybe. That's it. It's this one, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we can see it already. It's not on presentation mode yet. Okay. There's nothing to do with the Swiss mountain. It has to do with me. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so that was the first one. I'll go there. Is this okay for you? Yeah. Can you please use the, the presentation mode on, on the PowerPoint? Um, Sure. Um, actually, it's not easy to. On the bottom, bottom right side. The next one. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Is this okay for perfect. you? Perfect. Yep. Yeah, perfect. Now. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry for those precious minutes lost. Um, the agenda. So I'll be quick on the, the, the China and Southeast Asia business landscape, then IP crash course, I don't think it's useful because I guess that the previous speakers did it very well. Uh, anyway, I'll be, I'll be probably explaining a few, a few things about that. And then uh, some interesting uh, confrontation within Asia between the, the, the cultural features that, that are there for our, thousands of years and, and the new trends. And then basically what we're supposed to be talking about today, um, IP specifics for China and Southeast Asia in the health sectors. Um, I'll be quick on the China and Southeast Asia business environment. Um, the predictability, uh, I mean here, especially what when it comes to, to legal source, actually, um, I would say that I would, uh, most of these countries are, are very, very predictable now. Um, this is mostly due to the fact that all became step by step, one by one, a member of the YTO and they, of course, adhere to the TRIPS agreement, which are IP uh, global uh, regulation uh, applicable to all those states might be different for some poorer and least developed countries like Myanmar and Laos. But anyway, uh, they are all getting very predictable to to due to the use of of those uh, global tools, legislative tools. As to economic growth and demand rates, that was still in, on my slides two years ago, one year, one year ago, but you know, with COVID, I just don't know and nobody knows. So I'll skip that one. As to the political factors and stability, I think the region is quite stable. And um, 
there's not much comment about that. Um, just to make sure we understand about what countries we're talking, go back to the business environments. Uh, of course, China, which is composed also of Hong Kong, it's important, and, and Macau, and Southeast Asia, which is, um, let's say, governed by kind of a supranational organization, which is called ASEAN. And uh, the countries uh, are, I'll try to list them uh, accurately, it's Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Philippines, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, Myanmar, and, and, um, and Brunei, the small one. Um, this is all together uh, close to 1 billion uh, inhabitants. So it's a huge area. Uh, I think it was worth mentioning because we don't realize that those people are so, so many in that area. If you add the 1 billion point four of, of Chinese citizens. Uh, the IP crash course, uh, I think, has been done. It's, it's mostly about legal monopolies um, in defined territories, basically. If you have any question on this, um, please come back to me. Yes, of course, copyrights um, are interesting. You don't need to register them. They just created at the time of creation of your uh, artistic creation. Uh, interesting to know that, of course, they include software. Software are protected by copyright. And they're global, or almost global. For all the others, this is limited to certain territories where you registered and uh, during a specific time, 20 years usually for patents, 10 years for trademarks, 10 years also in, in average for designs and models, etc. Any questions, please come back to me. Um, I want here to, to be talking about um, this uh, key element of China. China is 5,000 years civilization and when we want to make profitable business with Chinese businessmen and women, we need to we need to understand a few things. I would say that these slides would uh, deserve uh, probably five full webinars. Uh, I'll try to do this in three minutes or five minutes, maybe. Um, I'll there's this human factor which is very important whenever you want to be profitable and 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 efficient in china please um keep time available for your counterparts human factor is very important building trust with them meaning um being able to understand i will be maybe asking 10 times the same questions uh they will disappear um uh, two days after being almost ready to sign a contract. Uh, and this is about what I call the, the, the passing of times, which is not the same for us and for them, really. Um, sometimes you think they are in a hurry and, and then they disappear. You don't know why. It doesn't mean you just crash one good business opportunity. It's just like that. Um, Social harmony is also very important. We are talking about a society, a, a huge society, which is actually based uh, not much on individual values, but very much on a kind of a social harmony, uh, which involves not only family, tribes, villages, but the, the, the whole nation and the whole people. It means that the hierarchy is very important. You need to know whom you're talking to. And it also means that you have to pay attention very much to what is called the face loss. A face loss can be terrible when doing business. And sometimes you just trigger what's called face loss, which is a kind of frustration of ego um, by saying a few simple things you would never expect it to be so damaging so we we need to pay attention to all those elements and uh, be always ready to go for 
uh, lunch or dinner with them. This is very important in, in China. I know that at the moment, I'm the first one to notice here that the travels are not easy, but they will come back soon, hopefully. And, uh, and this is important to keep this in mind. And they have great thinkers like uh, Confucius that, that uh, beautifully explained this like 2000 years ago, more than 2500 years ago. Um, that this is a very stable environment and uh, they would love what the ancient did and at the same time they will be facing the future uh, with um, no fear at all. That's why I'm, I just discovered uh, a few days ago the new plan, the 2035 China IP plan, which is very much about tech self-reliance and uh, and the intent to become or to take the leadership of IP global policies by 2035. You know, China is not uh, really initiating this kind of long-term plans. And what we have seen so far is that they usually achieve them. So <laughs> um, we can trust them on this. Um, so they basically, when it comes to IP sp specifically, they, they, they are really improving their, uh, legislative, um, tools to, to, to protect, especially IP new technology, like, uh, big data, AI, genetic technology, but still please keep in mind that we are always talking about the 5,000 years civilization with all those uh, cultural features I've been explaining before. So it's a mix of both and they, they do it very well. They fare very well with this kind of, uh, mix of past and future. Um, when it comes to, to, to the latest trends, I, I paid attention in China, uh, for IP. Uh, we all know that China was a kind of a world champion of copycats, what's called copycat heaven or nightmare, depending where you're looking from. Um, there is a brand new trend. Um, the number of IP litigation cases against uh, Westerners um, activated by Chinese IP holders is uh, dramatically increasing. So it means that, uh, first of all, they, they took the precaution to register IP, which is one of the motto of the IPR help desk. Please, uh, please register, register before going, register your trademark, register your patents, whatever IP you can register, please do it in the country where you're going to go, especially in China, but anywhere in the world anyway. Here, the fact that we have a lot of Chinese companies suing Western companies for IP, for their own IP, means that first they technology rich, richer than maybe we have found. They're not only copying what we're doing by far, and it means that what we had to do in the past, like, let's say 10, 15 years ago, which was basically checking for copycats on, of our own, own services or products, um, should be considered still basically the same as before, but we should add and revamp the, the strategy and we should add a kind of a due diligence on, on the IP we actually register or want to register in China. It means that we have to make sure that we have the, the freedom to operate in China. Otherwise, we can face some um, unpleasant moment with uh, getting sued with uh, by powerful Chinese companies. This is, uh, as I said, a, a brand new trend and it's here to stay. Um, that's a key point, I think. Um, when it comes to the health sectors um, specifics for, for China, um, they're really very, very ambitious. Um, they're talking about mobile health, 
which is called M Health. They're talking about the digitalization of health and healthcare, and they will be using and resorting, and not in the future. They are using uh, big data analytics, blockchain, 3D printing, robotics, etc. This prompts inevitably uh, many impacts um, on their legislation, on their attitude as well, and. Um, I think we are um, seeing um, the new China coming with uh, impressive tools and, and methods to, to achieve what is called uh, in some international instrument, uh, talking about human rights, the, the right to health. And they will do this with their cutting edge technologies. So, um basically what i think is the most interesting in this case is um the issue related to drug patents um there are different kind of drug patents we'll be talking about the product patents basically and we have a kind of a battle or a trade-off or a balance that needs to be uh, established between two opposed teams, I would say. Um, the first team is the team of the innovator. Those guys, mainly big pharma, but not only them, pharma, let's say, have been investing a lot on research and investment, and, and they just expect uh, legitimately expect a uh, return on investment. So they want to be protected as much as possible because you know to put a drug on the market takes time, it takes a lot of time and resources. So they have some tools uh, available in the international convention that uh, allow them um, to feel protected and to get more safe and secure at the time of investing a lot to, to find and implement new, new drugs. On the, on the other hand, we have, uh, as we said, the right to health, uh, which is, um, of course, easier to achieve in wealthy countries, in, in Western countries, for instance, but is not uh, actually that easy for uh, the least developed countries and they have also some tools uh, which is the so-called BOLA exemption and uh, which allows to prepare for generics and um, also what is called the compulsory licensing which allows a local government let's say the Malaysian government decide that some local generics manufacturers of drugs can sell on that market of Malaysia only uh, generics because they're much, much cheaper. And uh, in spite of the presence and uh, of a existing patent, um, this is surrounded by different requirements and condition. But basically, we are here with let's say two teams with uh, different um, and very efficient um, tools to, to protect their legitimate interests because both interests are, are equally legitimate, at least in my view. Um, we can talk about the patent link linkage system, uh, which is a way to um, protect uh, the patent holders um that everything will make sure will be make sure um not to um allow uh, some generic manufacturers to um go on the market before any relevant similar uh corresponding patent is expired um in singapore they talk about pertinent patent so this patent linkage system, for instance, has been implemented in China only um, a few months ago. Uh, 
it's a very powerful tool uh, which uh, gives patent offices um, the ability to 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 search uh, any relevant uh, and similar patents um, before um, giving the ability to the authority which give the marketing approval uh, to to give this to um, generic manufacturers to 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 sell in those territories you also have the data exclusivity which is all the data which has been used by the innovators the the pharma who got granted the patent for drugs uh, it means clinical tests, uh, trials, and all the stuff, which is key. And this data have been, of course, um, communicated to the patent offices in order to get the patent. But the, those offices are not allowed to disclose this data immediately, as it can be for certain kind of patents. And when it comes to drugs, they cannot disclose this data during a certain number of years. Why? Um, because they don't want to give the, the potential generic manufacturers too early the critical information for them to be able to later manufacture or develop, manufacture and sell generic products. In the EU, the data exclusivity is 10 years, uh, which is the world record uh, in terms of duration. And the US is five years, in China, six years. And in all ASEAN countries is, is five years, except Myanmar, which is not yet forced to have uh, implemented such a data exclusivity system and will have to have this achieved by 20, 33, still some time to go. So I think this is um, this is the moment when when we understand that actually uh, there is no big difference between China and and uh, Southeast Asia. Um, and by the way, there is not much difference in the tools used by the U.S., by Japan, or the. Or, or the European Union compared to, to the tools in the hands of, of China or um, Southeast Asia countries, which means that you can find only um, kind of tiny details or um, non-major non features that, that, that are specific to one country. I would compare this to the European directive. The European directive as it says, give the main direction, the, the, the big principles, the major principles that you want to be implemented by the member states within two, three, four, five years by, by um, creating a national law. And of course, after 27 countries in the European Union have been transposing, which is the exact word, transposing the directive into their national law, you can find some tiny differences, some tiny distortion from one country to another. But basically, you you have the same general principles which regulate the the matter, what whatever the matter actually is the same in IP, and the specifics are not that many. Um, for instance, it's just a matter of information that the ASEAN as a cooperation examination program which is quite useful actually because every of those 10 countries patent office can go and ask their colleagues of the nine others if they have some information about the application they just received from from a innovate innovator um, it makes things easier and also it speed up the process of of getting granted your patent which was a Kind of a drag in some countries like uh, for instance in thailand until like 10 years ago you would have to wait until 15 years to get a patent which was almost uh expired at the time you you got it so 
was not really comfortable. So all this is being speeding speed up, and and I think it's 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 very good. Some specifics of um, ASEAN countries. Some of them are uh, like uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and Philippines. Partly is that they're using uh, common law jurisdiction. Uh, they are using sorry common law concept of law, which we don't see in the civil law countries of of the European Union. Um, Common law countries actually stem from the from England and and the UK have been extended to the old Commonwealth and and the US and uh, since Singapore and Malaysia were part of that um, Commonwealth once uh, it's uh, still applicable the the common law is still applicable in those countries and partly in the Philippines and Thailand what's the thought of passing off it's a way to protect your or to get a kind of a indemnification um, against anyone who used your branding in, in non-legitimate fashion. Uh, in the case, and this is maybe something which is important, in the case you would not have registered your trademark. So there is a protection for those absent-minded people who just forget to register. Uh, in most of those countries, it's the first to file system which applies, which means that uh, when it comes to registration, please go fast because the first first come first serve. And if you are the legitimate holder of a trademark, for instance, uh, of course you might then sue this first to file guy who just got granted the trademark which actually was yours uh, but good luck you you have to go for litigation you have to go for costs and expenses and uh, sometimes you will not win um, so it's always again good to remind everyone that registration is the first things to do when we go internationalizing our business and everywhere we go and in this case, especially in Southeast Asia and China. Uh, for copyright, I was saying earlier that uh, copyright is just emerging, created by the creation of the copyright, meaning the artistic crea creation, or in case of software, by coding the software. Um, anyway, in most of those Asian countries uh, where I used to personally witness the importance of getting some kind of piece of paper with a seal and with uh, some good information for your business counterpart, it's good to go for what they call a formal recordation of your copyright. So you have a copyright and then you ask the copyright office of the country to get a kind of a written evidence that you are the legitimate holder of that copyright and then you get a nice document with seals and nice colors and your name or your company name and 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 the the object of the copyright and it's always very good when you're negotiating in in asia and not only in china that you show your counterparts that you you are getting ready uh, that you are aware that you need to register and that you did it and that you even did it for copyrights where copyrights is basically not necessary to be recorded. So I think this is a, a good tip to know that. And, and by the way, this is where patents registration is, is very expensive. Trademark is much cheaper and copyright recordal is even cheaper. It's a matter of 100 or 200 euros. It's not that much more. So I wanted to, to explain um, what actually I started to explain about China because as, as I just pointed out, um, the situation is, is about the same everywhere in the world. So I explain what is a pattern linkage system 
I talk about the generics, which are the tools in the hands of the poor or the one who doesn't want to spend too much for their drugs, and rightly so. And now coming to evergreening, the evergreening effect is, is a kind of a trick used by mostly big pharma uh, to try to expand the protection of the initial pattern, which is usually 20 years, beyond those 20 years by indicating a second use or by slightly modifying the, the composition or by somehow modifying the but only slightly the initial pattern content and they then for this they will get five eight ten more years of protection and they can expand the actual pattern duration to up to 25 30 years which of course is totally opposing the famous human right which is the right to health because the longer you keep a patent valid and the more expensive is 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 the drug in the country where usually uh, people can't afford that kind of very expensive drug so evergreening is one of the tricky tools used by a uh, patent inventor but once again i don't want to be I want myself to strike a balance and say that, of course, most of drugs put on the market has been through a long process or long process of uh, the R and D um, um, work, which costs a lot, which is a um, which requires times and resources, enormous times and resources. So we can understand that these companies just try to get a um, highly profitable uh, return on their investment. It can be understood. Data exclusivity, I gave you the definition and the fact that for the EU it's up to 10 years and uh, in, in Asia it's usually five, uh, while it's six for China. Um, it also protects, of course, the uh, innovation, because of course, a patent protects innovation. If the patent holder has no interest, I mean, no, no profits to be done from, from the fact that he went through the application for patent and he, he loses uh, his exclusivity, his monopoly, his legal monopoly, only a few years after after getting granted the, the patent, then he has, in a second step, he will not invest any longer in innovation. And, um, and then innovation will be stalled everywhere. So it makes sense to protect, to protect patent. It makes sense to protect patent. And it makes sense to make sure that everyone in, on this planet have a cheap access to uh, health. So this is the usual impossible balance between those, those uh, two uh, sides of the, of the subject matter. I'm, I'm so sorry about that because there is no final, final uh, answer to, to this uh, um, terribly tricky questions. Compulsory licensing, as I said, is a tool in the hands of of uh, governments uh, that they can use to just uh, allow the selling of, of uh, generic drugs on their territory. There are some small discrepancies or distinctions to be made within the countries of uh, Southeast Asia, but really nothing, uh, nothing that would change your uh, strategy if you want to be um, accessing one of those markets. There's no reason why the Malaysian le legislation on compulsory licensing would, would uh, kind of scare you from, from operating in Malaysia uh, compared to Indonesia or compared to Philippines. So I don't think this is here and today the place where we should try to list the, the tiny details that distinguish one country from another.
another. Another hand which can also be um, interesting to, to underline is the fact that the litigation costs are very expensive everywhere in the world. And of course, um, generic manufacturers are not the richest um, and the wealthiest companies, of course. And um, when those guys have to go suing big pharma, of course, at the end, they are much more at risk to, to lose their, their legal action. So this is also something to be considered. Um, I'll move to what I actually said a lot already. Uh, please register 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 your ip before going uh, before going to trade fairs um, um, even if some of those international trade fairs offer a kind of a temporary solution uh, protection if you happen happen to 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 introduce a new product or services with them they can they can allow you to register a bit later, but basically, please do it as soon as possible. Again, as I said, um, we must, as Concerns Asia, put a lot of resources, a lot of time, be very patient, and have a lot of determination at the same time. Your Asian, Chinese or not, counterparts will always appreciate that you get ready for the business fights let's say and your determination is clear that you're prepared by registration of ip that you are proud of your products and services you're offering which and this is a very important point i think in asia being proud of your product doesn't mean being arrogant if you want to be arrogant in doing business in china you should maybe change location totally uh i think they are they got kind of sick of some western people always lecturing patronizing explaining that uh basically we are the best and you're going to listen to us so i think the best way to approach china and southeast asia because uh, southeast asia is very very concerned by the same kind of reaction and reflexes um is 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 avoid any kind of um arrogance with with um or counterparts they are great businessmen usually they know for thousands of years how to do business and we should not think that we know anything better they do uh one small sentence uh which is a chinese uh, proverb is that to steal a book is an elegant offense. I think it, 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 it might be a sec secondary observation, uh, but it's just like this, and it was like that for centuries in China. It was a honor for any writer, painter, or whatever creator to be copied. And this is why they decided to they, it's not a decision actually this is why this this proverb uh exists to steal a book is an elegant offense so it pleased actually the writer it pleased the author it might explain at least in the beginning why copycats were so um commonplace in china it's a part of the explanation only but i think this is important to understand also the the Chinese um, mindset. So um, I, I want to I want to finish this. Um, yeah, one more thing I, I forgot to tell you. Why am I so much talking about China and China um, um, influence? Um, because in all ten countries of ASEAN. The Chinese minorities, uh, which have been living there for generations, if not centuries, usually account for 20, 25, 30% of the population. 
up to 60, almost 60 person, I think, in Singapore. It means that um, because, as I said, they're really very smart and wise businessmen in most of those countries, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, and of course, Singapore, um, Chinese minorities are basically in control of big chunks of business sectors. So if they are of Chinese extraction, so China is very influential, not politically, just the mindset is there in all those countries. So I come to, to a kind of anecdote I, I've been through once in Beijing, and we had a like five to six meetings, uh, one every day with a French client about selling the French client mobile services to some telecom, big telecom, of course, public company in in China. And and the the atmosphere was very good, and we we had a really pleasant relationship. And and but still, we had a lot of question mark. We didn't know actually what was in the mind of our counterparts. Um, we didn't know whether they actually wanted to do business with us. We didn't know whether they would actually um, set more requirements or which kind of requirements. We, we were a bit um, lost on this. Still in a very good and, and pleasant, smiling environment. So leaving the, the meeting room, I, I was discussing with, with the number one manager and i told him and told him this the more i go to china and the less i understand and this guy very nice guy started to smile and laugh at me but kindly gently and told me you're on the right way i just reply i'm sorry i'm sorry i really mean it the more i go to china and the less i understand you guys and then then he told me something I will never forget. He said, Philip, it seems that you understand we are a very complex country because we are a very, very ancient civilization. So it means that you're modest, that you know that you need to learn about China. This is why I'm saying that you're on the right way. You're modest, you want to learn, you will learn, and at the end you will be successful in doing business in China. So this is what I wish you all. And I thank you for listening to my today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you very much for, thank you also, Alessandra. Thank you both for these very interesting and, and informative presentations. First, I think the, the help desk can be an invaluable tool for, for European startups and SMEs that aim to protect the, and enforce their intellectual property rights in China and in Southeast Asian countries. Uh, and second, I think this, this presentation really emphasizes, as, as you were saying, the importance of bearing in mind the role of culture and history in doing business, also, also in this, in this specific countries. So we have a couple of minutes for, for questions. I'm not sure uh, there are any questions from, from the audience so far. So, so we can go for drinks. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm not sure if Miguel or Vera uh, have any any questions. Also, I think this goes in line with Philip said. The more we know, the less. <laughs> the, the more we understand it. <laughs> yeah, we understand less. Yeah. But 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 indeed, this show. I I think this shows how much important is the IP, uh, as Patricia is saying. This is business in the end. So we, nobody is there just to give you a patent and, and let you sell your products uh, happily. So this is a business. There's competition. You mm -hmm. need to be strategic. You need to understand different cultures and, and countries and, and indeed just make use of, of this amazing service that we have in, in European Union to, to go to other countries. And, and thanks, thanks for sharing. But I think I don't have questions now that I can bring up. Let me. Uh, okay, so, so I think we have a question. 
in meanwhile. Um, the question is about uh, the IP perspective for Japan. Um, this is something similar to China uh, when we speak about IP or probably Japan is, is more closer to what we are more used to Europe and our US oh. on IP because we, I think we, we often don't speak about Japanese. Yeah, uh, yeah that's I, don't, I don't know if it's, it's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> No, no. I mean, uh, Japan is, is is a great mix of uh, Western tools and Asian, Confucian, and and Japanese thinkers culture. So, um, and of course, it is a is a country which is uh, very wealthy when it comes to innovation. I mean, they 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 application their application for patents is is huge compared to the population. So I would just apply the same, the same, let's say, advices or general principles of action and come to Japan with the same mindset. Even if probably Japanese people, of course, it's always difficult to make a kind of a generalization of what is a Japanese people mindset compared to a Chinese people mindset. Uh, there are so many individuals and with so many, but I think that basically they are very different from one from, one from the other, Japanese and Chinese. But at the end, uh, I, I don't think I would take away any of the tips and, and uh, advices piece of advices i give today for japan basically is the same not being arrogant um be proud of your product be prepared um you know understand that they will be asking questions you were not expected to etc etc so yes do they have a common ground definitely yes this is eastern asia yes Thank you. So, yeah, Miguel, do you have any no, no, other? No, okay. Uh, so, if there are no other questions from from the audience, there is a comment here. Um, yeah, a comment from Cristiana Braga. Uh, she says uh, she says I particularly enjoyed this cultural perspective. Philip just made me recall about. Irving Goffman's theory of faces, which I think it's important in every context of communication with other people. Yeah, when we're talking about business, we're uh, we're talking about communication and and people in the end of the day. So I think this is all about all about this also for for IP protection and and in this uh, in this context. So um, thank you again for for your insightful thoughts and and for sharing your your experience. I will ask you now to. Um, I will change the uh, the your your share screen sharing, and I will share uh, my screen. I think you're already seeing uh, my screen now. So before before closing this webinar, um, this first webinar of the autumn autumn series, I'd like to thank once again the speakers and and also the attendees. Hope this has been an interesting session for everyone. And I invite you to follow the, the updates on the program of this series uh, online in our website. And, and for that, you may use the, the QR code on, on the screen to go to the program. And also through the Health Cluster Portugal and the IT Health Social Network. So you can know more about these and, and other activities of, of both organizations. Next Tuesday, we'll have a webinar that is dedicated to the topic of uh, IP protection, but regarding the specificities of health-related software. So I hope to see you all there, uh, same time, same place, and have a nice week.